Okay, so let me start. Um, so, um, hello everyone, my name is Shen Fu. I'm a, a PhD student at Brown University. So thank you first for this opportunity to give, to give the presentation. Uh, I would like to talk about using the Rubin LSST science pipelines to process deep DCAM exposures from the Lovox survey. So let me first give a brief introduction to this survey. The local volume complete cluster survey is an NSF uh, neural lab survey program that uses dark energy camera to, capture, to measure the dark matter distribution and the galaxy population in 107 nearby X-ray luminous galaxy clusters that are not obscured by the Milky Way. Uh, the depths will be LSST year one to year two at the UGRZ bands. Uh, about 40% of the data has been taken and the survey will be completed in around 2023. Uh, the survey collaboration consists of 21 researchers from 22 universities and uh, institutes. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Uh, I'm leading the processing of the DCAM exposures for the survey clusters and, uh, with the Rubin SC science pipelines. Uh, the processing provides a real-world test of the software's performance. We would like to thank the Rubin Science Pipeline team for teaching us how to use the software. Um, the input for the CCD processing includes DCAM raw and uh, calibration images, uh, Gaia as the astrometry reference catalog, PanStars, and SkyMapper as the photometry reference catalogs. So for example, the figures on the right show the raw image and the clasp of a CCD pointing at the glass cluster center. Uh, then we select CCDs with good observation conditions. Uh, the figures at the bottom right show the distribution of star sizes and shapes in a visit. Uh, then we build a sky map, run joint calibration, co-addition and co -add measurement, and finally do the lensing analysis and the photo Z measurement. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, the figure on the left shows the optical image of ABLE 85 overlaid with lensing mass distribution and X-ray, tangier X-ray map. Uh, at the bottom right, we show the deep images of diffuse galaxies, mergers, and tidal arcs contained in the optical image. So those are from Lovox images. We would like to point out that Lovox will also allow a clean comparison of, of thin variable objects when combined with LST year one data. Uh, Noir Lab newsletter in June this year has reported this survey. Uh, we are building a website about the survey. We plan to finish our first paper by the end of this year. We will talk about the parent processing details and the preliminary results. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Shen Ming. Just as impressive the second time as it was the first. Um, I encourage people to um, give claps on Slack. So there'll be no Q&A just now. We'll, we'll save everything for the session at the end. So we'll move straight on to our next speaker, uh, Matthias Buena on distant Milky Way satellites. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm Matthias, a postdoc at uh, Max Planck in Munich, the MPE. Um, so this um, little project, well, how it started, um, we're looking at results from cosmological simulations of satellites around the Milky Way. And for example, here you have um, from back uh, 2019, uh, the, the gas fraction, the, the cold to um, stellar and cold gas as function of radius. And you see that many satellites are already within the halo and are by well, definition called the satellites, but then you have a weird satellite that went through the hot halo, sorry, the halo of the Milky Way type galaxies and now are in the outskirts. And these are called the backsplash systems. And so what people find is that they could contain as much gas, for example, than the field dwarfs. However, uh, because they got uh, feel the tidal forces from the Milky Way, they lost some fraction of dark matter, which is what you see in the, the right plot. So here you have the, the, the function of distance, uh, the, the number of satellites and the ratio of the minimum uh, radius and the, the beta radius. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is our Milky Way. And you see a similar plot of um, hydrogen mass to um, luminosity. And you have the distribution of, of satellites um, as a function of distance. 
And um, in yellow or orange, you see all the gasless satellites living within the halo. Um, but you also have gas rich dwarfs um, like Leo T and uh, Phoenix. Um, you can see that their properties are more or less similar, things that are 10 to 4 to 10 to 6 in luminosities and uh, um, surface brightness, something between 27 to 22. However, the problem is where the view radius is marked by this dashed line, but then you don't see many uh, satellites beyond this. Um, there are a few that are gasless. So the question is, where are these backsplash? Like, can we identify them? Can we pin pinpoint them? So um, in the next slide, please, and the last one. Um, what we did is yeah, we wrote a code that calculate orbits backward in time. It's called DeLorean. And um, yeah, it, the code that explores several systematic uncertainties, uh, for example, uh, differences in very mass of the Milky Way, the Christian history of the Milky Way, the dynamical friction, even cosmic expansion, and the effects of N31, because, well, studying objects that are like 700 kiloparsecs away. Uh, at the end, we found, surprisingly, for example, that you could find some backsplash solutions for Leo D, Eridanus II, and Cetus, which is what you see in this uh, middle panel as distance to the Milky Way as a function of time. Uh, the color is the tangential velocity, so we don't know ex very well the proper motions. So I, this code, you can study a wide range, range of uh, proper motions, and we find some backsplash solutions if the velocity is lower than something like 70 kilometers per second. And um, we also did uh, run pressure studies. We found that they could survive, like some of these dwarfs could survive the run pressure. Um, and for Phoenix, for example, we found only first info solution. And this is because it's already quite built in and it's too fast. So you would need a Milky Way of, I don't know, double the mass that, that we know. And yeah, we also included even like embody um, simulations like the one in the corner to test our orbits, how accurate they are. And because these are like low density, it's a low density environment, uh, there were no strong effects. Yeah, so um, hopefully in the future we can discover with LSSD more of this backsplash and maybe you can learn more about the uh, Christian history of the local group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, okay, we will move straight on to our next talk. Um, please share claps for that talk. So next, we'll hear from Ryan Jackson on the origin of low surface brightness dwarf galaxies. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan, from the PhD student from the University of Hertfordshire. Um, I'm going to talk about the origin of low surface brightness dwarf galaxies. So our statistical understanding of galaxy evolution is fundamentally driven by objects that are brighter than the surface brightness limits of current wide area surveys. Therefore, our comprehension of galaxy evolution is largely restricted to relatively bright galaxies. However, both theory and observational work are starting to indicate that many galaxies are fainter than the surface brightness limit of these surveys, especially at the low mass end of galaxies. In order to study these galaxies, we use the hydrodynamical cosmological simulation New Horizon, which has a stellar mass resolution of 10 to the 4 solar masses and a maximum spatial resolution of 40 parsec making it an ideal tool for investigating the evolution of dwarf galaxies. In this study, we explain one, how low surface brightness dwarfs form, and two, why at a given stellar mass do dwarfs have a large range in surface brightness. Uh, next slide, please. The plot on the left shows the surface brightness versus stellar mass plane for galaxies in New Horizon. They primarily populate a locus going from low mass faint surface brightness to high mass bright surface brightness, indicated on the plot by the dotted lines. A minority of galaxies undergo a significant scatter from this relation. To study what determines a galaxy's position within this plot, we split the galaxies into three mass bins and three regions. These are the lower and upper locus, which are the faintest and brightest galaxies in each mass bin, and they're separated by the dash line, and off-locus galaxies, which are the galaxies that are scattered above the dotted line. These regions are all indicated by the colour coding that you see. We find that the main property of these galaxies which influences their final surface brightness is supernova feedback. The plot on the right shows how this evolves with time, and we can see that in all mass bins, galaxies that end up being fainter exhibit higher supernova feedback at early times. The early supernova feedback is caused by galaxies forming in regions of the cosmic web with denser dark matter, 
and therefore having increased grass inflow rates at high redshifts, as seen in the table. This causes rapid star formation and high supernova feedback that quenches these galaxies. Next slide, please. New Horizon galaxies populate a well-defined locus in the surface brightness stellar mass plane with a spread of around three mags per arc second squared, which is in good agreement with observational data. Low surface brightness galaxies form the majority of galaxies in the dwarf regime, indicating a large discovery space for LSST. Galaxies with fainter surface brightnesses today are born in regions of higher dark matter density, and this results in faster gas accretion and more intense star formation at early epochs. The resultant supernova feedback flattens gas profiles and creates shallower stellar profiles, creating a more diffuse system. At low redshift, tidal perturbations experienced by these systems accelerate the divergence in surface brightness by increasing their effective radii and reducing star formation respectively. A small minority of dwarfs depart from the main locus towards high surface brightnesses, making them detectable in past wide surveys. These systems have anomalously high star formation rates that are triggered by recent flybys or merger-driven starbursts, but they're not representative of the general dwarf population. For the full details and analysis, please go to the archive link and thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ryan. Fantastic stuff. Um, please share applause on Slack. Um, so we have one further speaker, so we'll move on to uh, Renuan Zhang, uh, speaking about stacking to study low surface brightness intracluster lights. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is going from the smallest galaxies now to the largest cosmic structures. And as many of you probably already know that there is a low surface brightness diffuse light inside galaxy clusters called intracluster light. On this slide, you can probably see the most obviously around the central galaxy uh, that is in the middle there. But this kind of like diffuse light really goes much further um, than what you can visibly see in this image. Um, like most of the deep images would uh, find them at least to about 100 kiloparsec from the cluster centers. And if you analyze a large cluster sample, uh, there is a hope to detect them out to about one meg per sec from the cluster center. So that's what we did with the DS data. Um, like we looked at the light profiles of, of about uh, hundreds of galaxy clusters and then take the average of the measurements. And that allowed us to um, basically get a measurement that goes to about one meg, meg per sec on the cluster center and going to a, a relatively low surface brightness level. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the methods on Thursday, um, but one thing that I want to uh, talk about is that using this kind of averaging and stacking method really also allows you to derive a stacked or averaged background that you can use to subtract from the measurements of hundreds of clusters, and that gets rid of like some small scale fluctuations. And next slide. Um, so there are many reasons to study intracluster light, and here I just want to highlight one of the uh, things that I found to be really exciting these days. Um, this started about two years ago when Montes and Trigello, they looked at the intracluster light density contours um, in some Hubble clusters, and they also compared that to the maps of dark matter inferred from strong lensing and also to X-ray. And surprisingly, they found like a, a very striking similarity between the intracluster light, surface brightness contours, and dark matter. And because intracluster light contains diffuse stars and dark matter contains uh, diffuse dark matter particles. So there was this speculation that uh, low surface brightness intracluster light could really tell us about the dark matter distribution inside the galaxy clusters. So together with a student, we looked at this, um, um, this um, aspect using the uh, DS measurements. So we, we compared the radio measurements of intracluster light, uh, which is the red line shown on the right side of the slide, um, to, that, uh, to that of the cluster dark matter measurements from weak lensing, which are the blue lines. And you can see that there is quite a bit of similarity between their radio distributions. And uh, therefore, we think that it is quite possible that uh, intra-class light could provide information about the dark matter distribution. And then moving to the next slide. Um, so regardless of whether or not you believe that intra-class light traces dark matter, we believe that intra-class light is definitely going to be a good indicator of the total um, uh, matter inside galaxy clusters. 
So in the middle of this slide here, I'm showing a, a panel with five different lines that is showing the integrated fluxes in intra-class light as a function of cluster mass. And then these five color lines are integrated to different radius ranges. Um, regardless of which range, you also see like in your cluster light, their total luminosity is always increasing with cluster mass. So it could definitely be used to indicate cluster mass. Um, but if you look at a larger radius range, which is um, the gray line on top of the uh, uh, plot there, the larger radius you go, the slope is deeper. So if you uh, have a way of measuring intracluster light, we really high, uh, highly recommend that you measure it uh, as you know, uh, the steep slope there will really tell you about the total amount of matter inside clusters. There is something else as well. For example, once you scale the intracluster light surface brightness by cluster uh, radius, all of the intracluster light appears to be self-similar. They appear to be uh, a similar, you know, and then that means that there is indeed a strong correlation between intracluster light distribution and cluster mass. Um, so I was also want to point out that the results shown here has been compared to simulations. And if you want to learn more about this, uh, um, I hope that you can check out our paper. So thank you. That's it. Thank you again, Wen. Uh, please share applause for Yang Wen's talk and indeed for all of our speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, so that concludes the uh, speaking part, the presentation part of the session. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Keith now, and we'll enter the Q&A section, which should take us uh, up to the uh, next uh, 10 minutes or so. So over to you, Keith. Great. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so, so we'll, yeah, we'll look on the, on the Slack channel and on Zoom, um, and you can direct questions towards individual speakers or have more of a, of a panel style question, which might be nice since all the, all the talks are related to each other. Um, so let me, let me start by looking at the, at the Slack channel and seeing what questions there are. Um, I see that, that uh, Jeff Carlin had a question. Would you like to ask that? Sure, yeah, this one's um, for Ryan. I noticed that you, there was, there was, or yeah, there were a handful of, um, galaxies below the main locus where you selected your samples, um, meaning that they're extremely low surface brightness. Um, do you have any idea the the origin of those systems? Um, yeah, so it it seems to be that the, the kind of processes that are operating here are scale-free. They kind of um, work at all stellar masses. But we didn't want to include those ones because they were skirting a bit too close to the like particle resolution limit of what we would consider to be a real galaxy for the simulation. Yeah. Um, so we, we did check, but there were there was um we just didn't want to include them just in case. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. And I see that uh, that Colin has his hand raised. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, this is for Matthias. Um, so I'm just trying to understand the initial slide here where you figure out, so like the conclusion is that you figure out where the, where the satellites at very large radii come from, uh, but you phrase it in terms of answering a question about where are the remaining backsplash galaxies, but what suggested that there are missing backsplash galaxies to you? I mean, for me, it would be, thank you for the, for the question. Um, this would come from the cosmological simulations that indicate that you should have such uh, population which ranges between 20 or 40%. So I was just doing like an orbital analysis, trying to pinpoint um, the ones we know, and then try to determine if they could backsplash or, or not. Um, so, sorry, just to, can you say what that 20 to 40 percent number is? That's that's the one thing I can't quite tell from the slide itself. Um, well, this is one example, but um, I mean, there are like um, other simulations like Rocha or Simpson, they find this range of like this fraction between one and two via radius. Maybe it wasn't clear about that. Like, of course, beyond that, you have exclusively first info, like field wars. 
Sorry, I didn't <laughs> answer. Sorry, it's just the, the fraction 20% means the number of galaxies outside of the virial radius over the total number of galaxies. No, no, sorry. That, that fraction is from one to twice, uh, two times the virial radius. Over the total number. Over, no, over the, that volume only. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I see that um, uh, Chris has his hand raised, and I see Chuck also had a question about the ICL. Uh, Chris, is your question about the ICL or, or a different topic? It's also about the ICL. Okay, so why don't, why don't we do both of those questions? Um, do you want to go first, Chris? Sure. So I was really, this is for uh, Juan Juan, I was really intrigued by your uh, talk and the connection possibly between dark matter and the ICL. And I was just curious, is there sort of a consensus as to the origin of the ICL light? Is it, is it thought that there are low surface brightness galaxies that have stars in them? Or is this just really amorphous gas which, with isolated stars around producing the light? Is, is there a consensus in the community about what really, where the light really comes from? Um, so there's probably some experts online about simulations uh, that can uh, also has expertise to answer the question. My understanding is that it's actually mostly just um, stripped stars from um, a, a, like galaxy merging process. Most of them is supposed to come from like galaxy merging, stripping, and disruption. Um, the dwarf, like the low surface brightness galaxies is only supposed to make up a small fraction of it, very small. So it's really just stars that have been flung out of the galaxies because of tidal interactions between galaxies. That's my understanding, yeah. Okay, thank you. I see that uh, Knut has a, a similar question. Yeah, uh, uh, it was a great talk. Um, I was also intrigued. Um, so uh, to, uh, following on, on Chris's question, um, if, if it is you know, stripped stars, um, uh, uh, what, is, what does it say about, you know, I guess, how many events you need for that to happen, given the long dynamical time scales out of those radii, I uh, wouldn't think it would be anywhere close to uh, in dynamical equilibrium. Um, yeah, so uh, that question, uh, I mean, I think it's, um, uh, there isn't, um, myself haven't found a, a sufficient answer to that yet. Um, so one thing is that we did look, look at a simulation and then the simulation doesn't quite predict what we have observed. Like in a simulation, it looks like um, the light is a bit uh, more concentrated towards the, the center than what we are seeing in observations. So it is possible that um, somehow like in the observations, we see that the stellar particles have more time to virilize uh, and relax uh, and the simulations haven't quite got there yet. Um, so um, there is that. I think the um, answer to that question is still quite widely open at this point, And we really need more studies to tell from both simulations and observations. Um, OK, thanks. And I, I see a question um, from Sukhanya. Uh, on Slack also about the, the origin of the ICL, if you'd like to ask that question. Um, hi, thanks. Yeah, I was wondering if you looked at the variation in light to mass ratio with the ICL measurements as a function of radius, and particularly when you determine the total mass um, from the ICL, and I, I guess this also goes back to an earlier question um, as to the, the origin of that, and whether if it's strip stars or, or um, those surface brightness galaxies there. Uh, yeah, so we look at the light uh, to, um, let's say, total mass ratio, you know, from weak lensing. So that's really less than 1% at the level of 0.05 or point, uh, like 0.5 or 0.1% level. So it's really tiny. Um, um, yeah, so does that answer the question? Was there a second half of the question? Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I, I mean, I, I guess I was, I was also curious um, to ask, you know, to what extent, 
you know, can we speculate at the moment about the origin of um, the ICL and whether it's due to low surface brightness galaxies or, or strip stars? Is there, um, is there something that we can say at the moment about that? Um, yeah, so uh, I think most simulations predict that it's stripped stars. Um, so um, um, that's what the simulation I read uh, gave me the answer about. Um, observational wise, um, um, I personally um, have seen that the ICL color is quite consistent with regular cluster galaxies. So that, you know, that uh, does indicate that it probably mostly come from um, the stripped uh, stars, um, but still we haven't been able to decide like what a fraction is from the different origins. Good. Thank you. And now I see two quick, uh, more uh, observationally oriented questions about the ICL. Uh, one, uh, uh, looks like Chuck asks, what's the angular scale of the extent of the intracluster light? And then I believe Chris Collins asks, uh, can you please comment on whether the ICL converges at R200? Yeah, Keith, uh, Chuck here. Um, just to clarify my question a little bit, um, what I'm interested in is um, how the angular scale of ICL relates to expected instrumental artifacts in the um, Rubin uh, Observatory Telescope and Instrument System. And so that's, that, that's the origin of my question. So what is the, so what is the typical angular scale? What's the range of angular scale on the sky for uh, ICL? Is it arc uh, minutes? Is it tens of arc minutes? So yes, so um, the, um, the a scale of RCL is indeed at a scale of like uh, arc minutes, like generally, you know, depending on redshift, you would be expecting two or three arc minutes. So okay. any kind of like diffraction light or uh, bright stars, they could really um, change the measurements results quite a bit. So you need to carefully consider these effects. All right. So we found that the ICL has the same scale as the dark matter in clusters. So that's tens of arc minutes for the big clusters. All right, thanks, Tony. So I'm just trying to correlate scale length here with instrumental artifacts. So I, I think we're, uh, we're, we're bumping up at the end of this first uh, 30 minutes. Um, so I mean, if, if there are any remaining questions, I would definitely encourage speakers to ask on the Slack channel um, and we can try to follow up on those. Uh, but otherwise you might wanna hurry off to your next session. Um, let's thank the speakers again for, for a great set of talks. That was, that was wonderful. Okay, uh, 17 after. So I think that's a good place to start. So welcome everybody to the Rubin Research Bytes Session C, Dark Matter and Low Surface Brightness. Uh, my name is Lee Kelvin, and I'm also joined as co-host by Keith Bechtel. Uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with by now from the previous session you're in, we have four speakers lined up. Uh, each speaker will speak uh, three, time, uh, three, three minutes, and then we'll have time for a Q&A session at the end. So um, I invite you to save your questions for the Q&A session at the end. There won't be time for questions after each talk. Um, and then you can address your questions either to individual speakers or to the whole panel. Uh, so speaking today, first we'll have uh, Shen Ming Fu talking about using uh, Rubin LFSD science pipelines to process deep DECAM exposures. Then we'll hear from uh, Matthias Blanya on distant Milky Way satellites, followed by Ryan Jackson, on the origin of low surface brightness galaxies in the dwarf regime, and finishing with Yuan Yuan Zhang speaking on uh, stacking the low surface brightness light envelopes of galaxies and uh, intracluster light in DES. Okay, so without further ado, I will hand over to Shen Ming. I think we can skip the reminders because you've already heard them in the last session. And Shen Ming, over to you. Okay, thank you. 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shen Ming Fu. I'm a PhD student at Brown University. Uh, thank you again for, all, for the opportunity to give this talk. I would like to talk about using the Rubin ST science pipelines to process deep DCAM exposures from the LAVOX survey. So let me first give a brief introduction to the survey. The local volume complete cluster survey is an SF uh, NOR lab survey program that uses the deep dark energy camera to measure the dark matter distribution and the galaxy population in 107 nearby X-ray luminous galaxy clusters that are not obscured by the Milky Way. The depths will be uh, ST year one to year two at UGI's events. About 40% of the data has been taken and the survey will complete in around 2023. The survey collaboration consists of 21 researchers from 22 universities and institutes. Could you go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, leading the processing of the DCAM images uh, for the survey clusters with the Rubin uh, C science pipelines. The processing provides a real world test of the software's performance. We would like to thank the Rubin science pipeline team for teaching us how to use the software. Um, the input for the CCD processing includes DCAM raw and the calibration images, Gaia as the astrometry reference catalog, and PanStars and SkyMap, SkyMapper as the ref, uh, photometry reference catalogs. So for example, the figures on the right show the raw image and the collapse of a CCD pointing at the gas cluster center. Then we select CCDs with good observation conditions. The figure at the bottom right show the distribution of star sizes and the shapes in a bit. Then we build a sky map around joint calibration, co-addition and the co-add measurement, and finally do the lensing analysis and the photo measurement. Uh, could you go to the next slide? The figure on the left shows the optical image of Eibo 85 overlaid with a lensing mass distribution and the changer X-ray map. At the bottom right, we show deep images of diffuse galaxies, mergers, and tidal arcs contained in the optical image along from the box. Uh, we would like to point out that Lovox will also allow a clean comparison of uh, faint variable objects when combined with LT year one data. Uh, NOAA Lab newsletter in June this year has reported this survey. We are building a website about the survey. We plan to finish our first paper by the end of this year. Uh, it, it will talk about the processing details and the preliminary results. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fascinating stuff. Uh, please uh, share your applause on Slack uh, for Shen Ming. So we'll move on to our second speaker now, uh, who is Matthias Blanger. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Max Planck in uh, Munich. Um, so here we're trying to understand the distant satellites of the Milky Way. Um, and what's the motivation for this? Um, well, in cosmological galaxy simulation of a Milky Way type, they predict um, that um, beyond the bigger radius of the Milky Way, there should be um, a dwarf called backsplash, which were systems that went through the halo of the Milky Way and now are outside. And such simulations like this one of the Nihau simulation from Bach predict that um, the properties should be a bit different from the first info. For example, here you have the uh, gas, cold gas to gas to and stellar um, ratio as function of distance. And uh, beyond the bare radius, which is this um, vertical line, you see that um, these triangles, which are the um, backsplash systems, and they have similar gas fractions to those of the, in the field. However, when they uh, measure the dark matter content, they can have uh, lost, uh, maybe lost a significant fraction down to 50%. Um, compared to the first infos. Um, so in the next slide, please. So when we look at the Milky Way, um, here you have uh, from the Kaneki 2012, uh, the hydrogen mass to um, stellar light as function of um, distance for all the, the satellites. Uh, also here are some of N31. Um, you can see here the vertical line is the, the Rear radius and most of the doors lost all their gas. But beyond this, you have some um, gas um, um, less uh, doors, but also some gas rich, like Leo T and Phoenix. 
And here we have some examples and they have similar properties like uh, luminosities and surface brightness. Um, here you can see some even uh, H1 contours which of the gas ridge. So some of these doors uh, should be backsplash. So where are they? So in the next slide, please. So we are trying to do orbital analysis. We built this code called uh, DeLorean where you uh, calculate orbit, orbits backward in time. You can explore different systematics like a very mass of the Milky Way an accretion rate, dynamical friction, cosmic expansion, and we can even consider the potential of the mid of Andromeda because these systems are quite far out, uh, up to 700 kiloparsecs. Um, and we found, for surprisingly, some backsplash solutions for Leo D, Eridanus, and Cetus. For example, this uh, is a distance to uh, as a function of time for uh, Leo T. And in color, you see the tangential velocity because we don't know very well the, the proper motions. And below 100 kilometers per second, we found um, and solutions backsplash um, that enter the VR radius, which is this black dashed line of the Milky Way. And we even did like some ramp pressure studies and we found that some of these uh, satellites could drive uh, the ramp pressure of the Milky Way. And we also even did some embody um, simulations to test if the dynamical friction and tidal disturbance would um, change the orbits or perturb the, the, the dwarf. Uh, but it was kind of quite similar to our semi-analytical analysis. So we conclude that Leo T and Eridanus II and Cetus could be backsplash systems. However, for Phoenix, we find, uh, found only for info solutions because the, this dwarf is falling already too fast for, and you would need a Milky Way double the mass that, that we know to, to keep the bound. Um, but now we still need to find uh, these other um, backsplash systems beyond the VR radius. And yeah, it, I think it's important because the properties should be different. They maybe look the same. They may have the same gas fractions, but uh, they're they're not the same. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. Fascinating stuff. Uh, please applause for Matthias. So we'll move on swiftly to our next speaker, Ryan Jackson, who's speaking on the origin of low surface brightness dwarf galaxies. Ryan, Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a PhD student from the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, so our statistical understanding of galaxy evolution is fundamentally driven by objects that are brighter than the surface brightness limits of current wide area surveys. Therefore, our comprehension of galaxy evolution is largely restricted to relatively bright galaxies. However, both theory and observational work are starting to indicate that many galaxies are fainter than the surface brightness limits of these surveys, especially at the low mass end of galaxies. In order to study these galaxies, we use the hydrodynamical cosmological simulation New Horizon which has a stellar mass resolution of 10 to the 4 solar masses and a maximum spatial resolution of 40 parsecs, making it an ideal tool for investigating the evolution of dwarf galaxies. In this study, we explain one, how low surface brightness dwarfs form, and two, why at a given stellar mass, the dwarfs have a large range in surface brightness. Next slide, please. The plot on the left shows the surface brightness versus stellar mass plane for galaxies in New Horizon. They primarily populate a locus going from low mass faint surface brightness to high mass bright surface brightness, indicated on the plot by the dotted lines. A minority of galaxies undergo a significant scatter from this relation. To study what determines a, a galaxy's position within this plot, we split the galaxies into three mass bins and three regions. These are the lower and upper locus, which are the faintest and brightest galaxies in each mass bin, separated by the dashed line, and off locus galaxies, which are the galaxies scattered above the dotted line. These regions are indicated by the color coding. We find that the main property of these galaxies which influences their final surface brightness is supernova feedback. The plot on the right shows how this evolves with time and we can see that in all mass bins, galaxies that end up being fainter exhibit higher supernova feedback at earlier times. This early supernova feedback is caused by galaxies forming in regions of the cosmic web with denser dark matter and therefore having increased gas inflow rates at high redshift as seen in the table. This causes rapid star formation rate and high supernova feedback that quenches these galaxies. Next slide, please. So New Horizon galaxies populate a well-defined locus in the surface brightness stellar mass plane with a spread of around three mags per arc second squared, which is in good agreement with observational data. Low surface brightness galaxies form the majority of galaxies in the dwarf regime, indicating a large discovery space for LSST. 
Galaxies with fainter surface brightnesses today are born in regions of higher dark matter density. This results in faster gas accretion and more intense star formation at early epochs. The stronger resultant supernova feedback flattens gas profiles and creates uh, shallower stellar profiles, creating a more diffuse system. At low redshift, tidal perturbations experienced by these systems accelerate the divergence in surface brightness by increasing their effective radii and reducing star formation respectively. A small minority of dwarfs depart from the main locus towards high surface brightnesses, making them detectable in past wide surveys. These systems have anomalously high star formation rates that are triggered by a recent flyby or merger-driven starburst and are not representative of the general dwarf population. For full details on the analysis, please follow the archive link and thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ryan. Some really lovely work there. Um, please share applause for Ryan on Slack. So uh, moving on to our final speaker of the session, uh, Yuan Yuan Zhang, uh, speaking on stacking to study low surface brightness intracluster light in DES data. Yuan Yuan, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So this is moving to the largest cosmic structures now. Um, as many of you uh, probably know that there is some low surface brightness light inside the galaxy clusters called intracluster light. They mainly exist around the cluster central galaxies. And uh, uh, if you can see in this image of the bullet cluster, um, the intracluster light is most obvious around the central galaxy in the middle of the image here. Um, but if you look at the pixel data from the image, you, you really can uh, find a measure intracluster light all the way to about 100 kiloparsec from the cluster centers. And if you analyze several hundreds of clusters, uh, like what we did, you might find intracluster light up to about one megaparsec from the cluster center. So we looked at intracluster light using dark energy survey data, basically analyzing several hundreds of galaxy clusters. Um, uh, our way is that we take the averages of the measurements of these several hundreds of clusters. And I'm going to talk more about the methods on Thursday. But one highlight of doing this kind of averaging is that then you can build a statistical background model that also takes into consideration of like sky variations and nearby contamination structures to subtract off to derive these intracluster light profiles. Um, and moving on to the next slide. Um, next slide. So there are many reasons to study intracluster light. And uh, my most recent, uh, sorry, previous slide. <laughs> um, so there are many reasons to study intracluster light. And uh, the thing that got me most interested was what was uh, proposed two years ago by Montes and Trujillo. Um, they looked at the intracluster light distribution inside some Hubble images of galaxy clusters and found that the surface brightness contour of intracluster light is surprisingly similar to the uh, dark matter density contour they inferred from strong lensing, and they, uh, they also compared that to hot gas. Um, so given that a striking similarity, there was this speculation that intracluster light is potentially tracing dark matter distribution because intracluster light contains diffuse stars and dark matter are diffuse particles. Um, so we looked at this kind of um, assumption into the gas data. Uh, we looked at the radio distribution of intracluster light as shown on the right side of the slide as the red lines. And then we compare that to the uh, radio distribution of total matter, which are the blue lines. And we did also see that this kind of striking similarity between the two and uh, think that, you know, it supports um, um, the idea that intracluster light is possibly tracing dark matter. And next slide. Um, so the exact tracing mechanism probably still awaits uh, further exploration. Um, but regardless of the results on that, um, you can, um, I think we have been, uh, good evidence that intracluster light is a good indicator of the total amount of matter inside galaxy clusters. So on this slide in the middle here, I'm showing the integrated luminosity of intracluster light to different radio ranges as a function of cluster mass. Um, so depending on your radio range, intracluster light, their total luminosity is always increasing with cluster mass. But if you go to a, a very large radius, as large as 500 kiloparsec, which is the gray line there, 
there is a very steep slope between intracluster light total luminosity and cluster mass. So you could uh, think about using the intracluster light total mass to infer cluster, uh, uh, to infer cluster masses. Um, there's other further evidence that we have shown, including that, you know, if you scale the intracluster light surface brightness by a cluster radius, they all look self-similar. And in the past, that is considered as another indicator of intracluster light tracing uh, uh, cluster mass. Um, um, so this is all I want to mention today, but I also want to say that if you want to see comparison of the res results to simulation studies, um, please uh, feel encouraged to check out the paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ringman. Uh, please share your applause for Ringman on Slack and indeed for all of our speakers. Thank you so much. So this concludes the uh, speaking section of the uh, session. So I hand over to Keith now for the remaining 10 minutes or so for the Q&A section. Over to you, Keith. All right, so he here's your opportunity to ask questions to the speakers. Um, so. Probably the, the preferred way to do this would be to uh, write your question in Slack, and then uh, we can see that and try to group, group similar questions together. Um, and you can either direct your questions towards individual speakers, or we can have more of a, of a panel style response um, since, uh, since we have uh, some, some related topics here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and ask a, a first question. Um, so this is, uh, this is a question for, for Ryan. Um, so your, the simulations that you presented uh, showed that there's some scatter and that some galaxies have a much larger surface brightness than others while having a similar stellar mass. I was curious um, to what extent that scatter, you know, since that's a, that's a relatively small fraction of the total dwarf galaxy population, you know, to what extent that scatter is sort of predictable or representative. I ask it from the standpoint of, you know, if we know that there are these selection effects that are impacting our study of the galaxy population, do we, you know, do we feel like these simulations are, you know, at a stand, you know, a place where they're robust enough that we can try to calibrate those selection effects? I mean, how, what do you see, sort of the the connection between the theoretical predictions that you're making and the observations that we'd be doing with LSST data? Um, so I, we we did compare to. Um, I go into more detail in this in the in the paper, but obviously for three minutes there wasn't enough time. Um, but we do compare to. Um, some data from uh, Tom Sedgwick's paper where he looked at um, Stripe 82 uh, SDSS data. And we find that um, where the regions where we have good overlap, we do match uh, very well with, with his data. So I think the simulations are doing a reasonable job of, of reproducing this uh, surface brightness stellar mass relation. The, the scatter that we do see, especially the, the extreme scatter, if you just go to the next slide. Uh, this kind of extreme, as we call them, the off-locus galaxies, um, they tend to be sort of uh, almost like starburst-like events. So they 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 happen quite frequently in the simulation, but they you know these are rare dwarf galaxies. Um, the worrying thing is that a lot of you know this is kind of the dwarf galaxies that you would see in something like STSS. Um, so if you're basing your dwarf galaxy studies off those galaxies, they might not be representative of of what dwarf galaxies are truly like if our simulations are correct. Thank you, that, that's helpful. And I, and I imagine that it's sort of in local regions of the universe, there's uh, sort of correlated environmental effects. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, we can't really study environmental effects hugely with New Horizon because it's uh, quite a small volume and it, it, it's kind of an average region, um, but yeah. Thanks. And I see uh, Yuan Yuan has a similar question, perhaps, or related question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if there are ultra diffuse galaxies in the simulation. I wasn't sure yeah. if I could see it. Yeah, so um, again, I didn't, for the sake of three minutes, I didn't, I didn't go into detail, but the, uh, the inset in, in this figure um, shows the surface brightness versus effective radius. Um, and, and that kind of dashed black line on that plot is, is kind of the observational uh, boundaries of what people consider to be ultra diffuse galaxies. So actually quite a lot of the dwarf galaxies that we see in New Horizon would be considered ultra diffuse galaxies um, in observations. And what's quite interesting from that is that we, we don't have a cluster environment, the, the most 
uh, dense environments we have in New Horizon is, is just groups. So this is indicating that you, you don't require a cluster to form ultra diffuse galaxies, that they, they'll form naturally in the field. Thank you, that's really interesting. I guess further evidence that there really isn't this distinct <laughs> population. Right? It's more yeah, like that. it just seems like a natural extension of, of dwarf galaxies to become ultra diffuse. Interesting. So, so Paul has a question uh, related to the ICL, if you'd like to, to ask that. Um, so, as you know, um, background subtraction is hard, um, especially if you're trying to please everybody um, in, in the sort of case of LSST, uh, where the, you know, the data products are going to be used to do uh, low surface brightness work as well as point source work. Um, so what prescription would you recommend for doing background subtraction on galaxy clusters in order to measure intercluster light? I mean, especially if you don't know a priori that there's a cluster there. Um, yeah, so um, for the work that we did with DES, uh, we, uh, our image is, um, uh, has gone through a separate image processing step. So um, in most of the DS studies, the official DS data pipeline, they use uh, some sort of a global background that is over uh, evaluated over the whole three degree, degree square field of view. And then there is also a local background that is subtracted for like, you know, um, near um, uh, bright objects. So that's what the official data processing pipeline. Um, but for this intracluster light project, we really only do the global sky background. And then um, we take that image and then the, all of the measurements are only done with the uh, low, uh, global sky background over the whole field of view. I should also mention that, you know, that also means any measurements uh, you don't have uh, after that is susceptible to nearby um, galaxies, especially foreground background galaxies or nearby bright stars. So there's a lot of contamination in the measurements. And then we do another separate background step for intracluster light in uh, my particular analysis, which is this contaminations um, nearby foreground background and stars um, averaged for like several hundreds of clusters altogether. So it's uh, averaged over the whole footprint. And then we subtract that off again to make sure that it is not just a background model for one cluster, it is a background model for all of the clusters together. Um, so I recommend global sky subtraction. On, on what sort of scale? Um, so in DS, we do it for the whole field of view, three degree squares, like of the image. Um, so sure, but it's not a single number for the whole field, right? It's going to have some sort of spatial scale. Um, it's actually just one single number. So um, a background value is, uh, um, is, is done for the whole field, like whole exposure. And then we only subtract that. You're very confident in the quality of your camera. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, we do do another uh, statistical background subtraction that evaluates another layer of background over the whole footprint. So that's why, like, um, we are using the stack or averaging approach here. I'd like to uh, to see if Shen, Shen Ming would would like to respond to this question as well, since since you've also done work on on DCAM uh, and galaxy clusters. Um, I just remember. There's a similar method for HSC, HSC images. I think it's also using the global background to improve the over subtraction, subtraction of the background near bright stars and bright galaxies. I guess the idea was similar. But I, I just, I like I said before, I think there's no previous study um, you know, implement this kind of method on DCAM images using the LSTE pipelines. So that's something we have to test. Thanks. 
And I see a question from Dan and posted in Slack. It looks like a uh, it looks like a question for uh, for Ryan. I'll go ahead and ask in case um, in case Dan doesn't unmute. Um, do do off locus galaxies stay off locus for very long? Uh, if the bright ones fade back towards the mean, how long does this take? What about the unusually faint ones? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, the off locus galaxies they don't. Um... They, they do move back onto the locus, sorry. So it's uh, usually over a couple of hundred mega years, maybe 500 mega years, that they will have a, a, a merger or a flyby with something. Star formation rapidly increases, they become very bright, then they uh, extinguish themselves, and then they'll move back to the locus. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're a transient population, but they, they obviously happen across time whenever a galaxy has a, a merger event. And um, for the unusually faint ones, um, we looked at those individually because we were curious about them as well, but they tended to be um, ongoing mergers. So it was where the, the structure finder from the simulation basically um, identified a, a large object, but it was actually two objects undergoing a merger and they just had a anomalous um, like faint surface brightness because of that. Well, I see that we are at the time, uh, a quarter two. Um, so uh, I'd like to just take, a, take another moment just to thank all the, all the speakers and everyone for asking uh, questions and contributing to the discussion. Um, I think we're taking a 15 minute break. Is that, is that right? If I've been following the Slack channel and then, and then we'll, we'll come back for the, for the next round. So thank, thanks everyone again. I certainly didn't mind hearing your talks twice. <laughs> thank you all, fascinating session. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for Thank hosting. You.